this week on the Back Table Podcast. There is another study out there that really studied how these look in mechanical heart valves. And when compared to, it was compared to warfarin. Okay. And basically what the DOAC said was that you would, it would require almost like a four times higher dose of dabigatran or Pradaxa to achieve an equivalent INR goal that warfarin would be able to achieve on a, on a normal dose or on, a, on an appropriate dose. So when you're considering something about, you know, a, a stent or a stent graft that uses, you know, these EPTFE materials, maybe go away from uh, these 2A or 10A inhibitors because warfarin may be superior in these. And that's why we've been using them in, in cardiac patients for so long. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Backtable podcast, your source for all things endovascular and minimally invasive. If you are a new listener, welcome. For all of our regular listeners, welcome back and thank you for listening. You can find all the episodes, um, I'm sorry, you can find all previous episodes of this podcast on iTunes, Spotify, or our website, which is www.backtable.com. Very easy to remember. Subscribe to the podcast, leave us a written review, very helpful, or reach out to us on social media. Let us know how we can make this podcast a better resource for our endovascular community, and we're going to do our best to make that happen for you. Before we dive into our topic today, just want to say a quick word from our sponsor, RADPAD. RADPAD radiation protection products, developed by physicians for physicians and clinically proven to protect during CINE and digital subtraction angiography. Don't bet your health on anything less. Trust RADPAD protection for all your interventions. See RADPAD.com for more information and contact info at RADPAD.com to learn more about radiation safety CME credits for you and your team. Our listeners asked and we have answered. We now have CME available. You can get AMA Category 1 CME for listening to Backtable and then filling out a reflection. You can find the CME links on episode pages at backtable.com, or you can also find the CME links in the show notes. It's a small cost for the credit, much less than you would spend at a conference, and it helps support the show. Powered by CMEify, using AI technology to bring the right education to the right place at the right time. You can do this in just a few minutes. If you're already listening to Backtable, might as well get a CME credit for it. Now, on with the episode. Today, we are going to be discussing anticoagulation regimens following venous stenting. Uh, to help us this with this discussion, we have Dr. Fred Bertino. Fred, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Chris. So, Fred and I were talking a little bit offline, and he completed his diagnostic residency at Emory and his IR residency at the University of Washington at Seattle. And he's currently in his pediatric fellowship at Children's Healthcare of Atlanta, which is uh, affiliated with the Emory program. So we've got a really well-trained guy, someone who's passionate about venous disease and anticoagulation regimens. Fred, welcome to the show. And how did you get interested in like venous, anti or venous stenting and anticoagulation? Yeah. So, you know, during my training up at University of Washington, we were seeing a high volume of venous thromboembolic disease. As you know, it's uh, a pretty big deal and it's growing, uh, especially with more and more interventions that we can offer for these patients. We, uh, I say we as me and my co-fellows trained pretty heavily under uh, Jeff Chick and Dave Shin uh, up there who were the program directors for UW, but both of them had a very keen interest in venous thromboembolic disease. And we were lucky enough to benefit from just a high volume of cases up there. They turned out to be some of the most fun cases in IR to do. And I got to see firsthand uh, how much they can really help patients uh, in relatively short order by taking their symptoms away. So we were looking for really good clinical success. And then after that, I think a the biggest question was how do you manage these patients afterwards because it's very easy to do the procedure and you can get quite quick and uh, have a really great outcome both on the venogram and a clinical outcome but you want that to be maintained for as long as you possibly can it's very hard to find data on this so i figured let's uh, search and see what we can find you know i somehow knew that jeff chick was going to tie into this discussion so he he was uh, one of your mentors at UW. I know this is uh, certainly a, a field of interest for him, and it looks like he's passed it down to you. Yes. Uh, Jeff Chick has a way of making his way into every discussion, and I say that <laughs> totally out of love. Love you, Jeff. Uh, <laughs> but yes, no, he, um, no, he was, and, and Dave Shen have been totally instrumental in uh, really kind of inspiring us to do what we can in this space. As I said, it's super under-researched, um, but it's definitely an area that needs a lot of growth. And the cases that you kind of reference that you can get uh, quick and kind of agile at, are these like some of the, the, like, it would look to me like very complex, like venous reconstruction cases where it's like chronic DVT and like atretic IVCs. Um, I'd be interested to know just um, those always to me seem like real bears of cases, but I guess with enough experience that if it just becomes like anything else, you just kind of march through it and progress through 
uh, yeah, algorithm. Certainly. Uh, the quicker cases obviously are going to be more on the acute DVT spectrum, easier to get through, easier to recanalize. The chronic ones certainly are going to take a lot more time, higher radiation dose procedure time. But, you know, when you have an organized kind of way of thinking about the case, knowing where you have to access and how you're going to approach getting through it, you can make them quite efficient uh, with the right tools and the right uh, methodology of it. So we kind of had a very standardized approach to how we would approach, uh, how we would do these things. And uh, they turned out quite well. That's nice. And so, uh, like you mentioned, um, anticoagulation is a, a kind of a cornerstone of maintaining patency, like any time you have um, venothromboembolic disease and, and subsequent stenting. Um, but can we talk about, can we back up and just talk about like, it seems to me like one of the challenges with talking about uh, anticoagulation following venous stenting is like the wide range of diseases that we could like kind of fall into this category. And like, I have a way that I kind of break it down in my head, but I was just interested, in, is there any way, like if you're talking about venous stenting, that you back up and talk about how maybe different uh, pathophysiologies are handled a little bit differently? Yeah, that's a that's a really good point to start with. I think understanding the pathophysiology of venous thrombosis is an area where we probably could learn more. But what we do know from some of these basic science, you know, studies that had come out in somewhat recent years is that uh, it looks more deeply about what the clot composition is actually made of. Venous clot is very different from arterial clot. We know that when you have, if, if you go back to medical school and think about Virchow's triad, we think about the hypercoagulability, venous stasis, and endothelial injury. In those arterial patients or arterial clot, if you injure the endothelium, you're going to expose von Willebrand factor. You're more likely going to have platelet plug formation and platelet rich clot in those kinds of situations. But when you go back and look at some of the early animal models, if you ligate an IVC in a mammal, you find also that you can develop more platelet rich clot because you've caused endothelial damage. And if you just clamp an IVC, you can also find that you develop more thrombin and fibrin rich clot because that is just because of the stasis and the inability of blood to flow. So it raises the question of what kind of anticoagulants or antiplatelet medicines you want to use based upon what you're doing to the vein at any one time. It would therefore make sense that antiplatelet regimens would not be as effective in somebody with venous clots because it's just not going to work on what it needs to work on. But then all of that logic gets thrown out the window when we think about putting a stent in the vein, because in doing stenting, you would in turn damage the vein. And then we also know that the clot itself also damages the endothelium over time when it turns chronic. It leads to a lot of um, confusing algorithms and, and really the nobody really understands what, what to do after that. So it requires kind of a, the understanding of that pathophysiology. So one of the things that kind of got passed down to me, and, and you, you kind of referenced it, is that uh, arterial clot was platelet rich, uh, venous clot is platelet poor. And so any platelet regimens tend to be less effective when you're talking about venous clot. Um, but that's a good point. Like, I just want to drill down on it that like whenever you're talking about venous stenting, it's you're talking about a different animal than you are talking about like thro just like uh, native thromboembolic disease. Absolutely. Yes. It's um, and that's important to, to mention again, like you said. So also going back to like not just the pathophysiology, but like the wide range of diseases that you will see that may require venous stenting. There's some non thrombotic diseases, just uh, like, you know, iliac vein compression, like May Thurner that end up getting stented. Just so I can set the tone for the audience, are we going to include thromboembolic disease and then separate out like uh, compression venous disease, or is it all going to fall under the same category with venous stenting? It'll fall under the same category with venous stenting, although when you have uh, patients with like a non-thrombotic iliac vein lesion, mm -hmm. uh, you, you will have to anticoagulate patients with something just to make sure that the stent stays open. But these patients typically shouldn't have to be on these medications lifelong. It can generally be for a lot shorter duration. So less aggressive anticoagulation regimen? Less aggressive, for sure. And in patients with malignant both thrombotic and um, non-thrombotic disease, also something similar? Yes. Um, from what we have our experience and in our practice, you know, if you are putting stents or stent grafts into patients to open their veins up again, we would definitely want to be a little bit more uh, aggressive with anticoagulating them, mm -hmm. at least until the material can get somewhat incorporated into the vein. After maybe the six month period when you develop some degree of chronicity, uh, you can see what you can do to get them off of it. Of course, you know, when you're dealing with malignant patients, that's a different story because their prognosis of their underlying disease may have some other implications. But for the most part, Yes. Aggressive anticoagulation, at least in the first six months, is going to be paramount. Got it. All right. So let's talk about uh, different anticoagulation regimens, and then we'll kind of dig into each of them and, and some of the nuances. And 
you know, I, I'm sure if you're a, a listener out there, you can be sometimes it's hard to extrapolate it to your specific patient because, you know, they have different nuances, either socioeconomic or, you know, contraindications to any coagulation. But we'll just kind of march through it and we'll throw some caveats out there as needed. Sound good, Fred? Absolutely. Yeah. OK, so um, I'll just open it up to you. Like, let's talk about like maybe your standard um, anticoagulation regimen for and you can set the tone as to what kind of patient it is. Sure. So I'll start by saying when we think about aspirin, because we think about, you know, you put a stent or a stent graft in somebody and then aspirin is like one of the first thing that, that comes to mind. There's a couple of studies out there that were in the New England Journal of Medicine a few years ago, uh, two trials, the Aspire trial and the Warfossa trial that talked about the benefit of using aspirin in venous thromboembolic disease. And there's really no benefit to using it for the prevention of, or at least the primary prevention of PE or DVT. What we can extrapolate, at least from some of the uh, animal data that's been out there, is that if you put a stent inside of a vein at the apposition points of that stent, uh, you essentially cause some endothelial damage. So there could be some benefit to giving aspirin with your anticoagulation regimen to prevent platelet-rich clot from forming at the apposition points. So keep that in the back of your mind whenever you're treating something, uh, you know, any patient where you're putting some sort of stent or stent graft in because the addition of aspirin can be beneficial. But, you know, oftentimes, I guess one of the more common situations is that someone will present to the ED with a DVT in the upper or the lower extremity. We would recommend initially initiating with uh, unfractionated heparin with a bolus dose. If they have a known history of HIT or some sort of intolerance to heparin, you can use your hospitals by Valerudin protocol. And uh, when it comes to the initial workup, which I'm sure we're all familiar with, a uh, duplex ultrasound, if it's not done already, and then a CTV is something that we very frequently did to map the veins, understand what the anatomy you're about to deal with and what you can do from a procedural standpoint. Early intervention in these cases we have found to be successful in long-term patency rates. And I think this goes back to thinking about the open vein model of uh, flow. The sooner you can open a vein, the less damage will happen to the, to the venous wall and the more long-term patency you can expect. There are a couple of other interesting trials that get thrown into the mix here. Uh, and these are very much experimental, but the Jupiter trial, also in the New England Journal of Medicine, would suggest that statin use can actually lead to a decreased inflammatory response in, in vasculature. And if your patient may be with other comorbidities like uh, ischemic stroke history or coronary artery disease or hyperlipidemia, if they're not on one, they probably should be on one. And maybe you can get a benefit from actually their venous health with this. The data in it is not super strong, but it did exist and uh, there is some literature out there. We know that uh, cardiovascular risk factors are uh, known to be in conjunction with comorbidities with accompanying venous thromboembolic disease, so that's why I mention it. Admitting these patients to your medicine team after the intervention, even before we start on whatever kind of anticoagulation regimen you want, is also going to be really important, at least just for the post-procedural monitoring, but also for making sure that they can get some degree of control over their disease in the immediate period. And from that, I mean, let's get physical therapists and occupational therapists on board to help this. Patients who are coming in with DBT probably in, in the adult world are may not be the most mobile patients. So considering a physical therapy consultation and more evaluation of what they can do to keep the lower extremities moving to prevent some sort of stasis risk factor from happening again when they get discharged from the hospital is another resource that we can all benefit from in the hospital, especially as IR is moving more toward this clinical mindset of bringing multiple teams on board for what they're doing. So having PT on hand and knowing your physical therapist and what they can do for your patients to get them up and out of the bed, especially after these procedures, is going to be extremely important. And obviously preventing falls because nobody wants a fall when you're on an anticoagulant. Sure. Right. So pre-procedure for these patients, let's say you've, you've worked up the DVT, you thought about your pre and your post plan, at least what you're going to do inside the hospital. You may want to consider doing a first dose of apixaban or rivaroxaban four hours before the procedure. This is, uh, comes from interesting animal studies to suggest that pigs who had iliac vein stents placed who received rivaroxaban or some sort of 10A inhibitor before their procedures or before the stent was laid actually had less in stent thrombosis afterwards compared to any other anticoagulant. We don't know why this happens particularly. We think it's probably because of the makeup of the venous clot in these animals, but there was a benefit there. Is this also on top of whatever anticoagulation, like any kind of heparin medication that you may have them on? Exactly. So okay, what I'm okay. saying so, now is going into sort of a gray area where we really don't have gotcha. any data to support the combination of anything. But at least in some early animal models in mammals, rivaroxaban or apixaban, maybe four hours before the procedure, could actually have like an augmentating event or effect rather to uh, 
to help keep that vein as open as possible and accelerate the post uh, procedural healing process after the vein goes in or after the stent goes in. Sure. You know, thrombin inhibitors, um, you know, when it comes to these these DOACs, I guess they're really not recommended for this kind of hybrid use. Again, everything that I'm saying right now doesn't have any trial behind it now, but it's basically can be extrapolated from other research that has been done. Thrombin inhibitors, you know, the advent of the DOACs have been amazing. They've been great when it comes to treating people with PEs and DVTs on an outpatient basis. It's an oral medicine. It's easy to take. Aside from some chances of increased gastrointestinal bleeding, they tend to work very, very well. I think one of the issues, though, is we don't know how great they are if you now have, uh, you know, a Teflon or a Dacron device in your vein. And uh, that that obviously confounds the effect of these DOACs. And, you know, I would be interested, of course, to hear and I don't know if you guys have a comment section, but at the same time, you know, if people have had better success with putting people on DOACs versus something like Rivaroxaban after the procedure, um, I think there's still a, a verdict out on that. I'm not sure people have one right idea versus another. I th- I, if it's my general suspicion, just thinking about my own clinical practice, is that it can be very patient specific and sometimes, uh, you know, situational. But I think we do have like a, we always put these out on Twitter. So maybe we'll put like out a, a, a Twitter, a Twitter poll or something. See if people want to weigh in on this one. Great. I'd like to know, too. Yes. So in, in when you're talking about the, the DOACs, now we're talking about post procedure, like post stenting and the thrombin inhibitors for following stent placement, correct? Sure. I'll say, actually, uh, this is still technically pre-procedure and very theoretical. Oh, okay. All so, right, yeah. Right. So even beforehand, you know, the patient's on unfractionated heparin, they come up with a DVT that, you know, they have to be on something to at least begin the process of healing the clot. You know, adding something like a Pixaban or Rivaroxaban could be beneficial. We don't know what it would be like to supplement the unfractionated heparin with a thrombin inhibitor at the current time. So let me ask you this. Is there, I mean, it sounds like it's just four hours four hours before the procedure, single dose. I mean, what's the real downside? I guess there's that always theoretical risk of increased bleeding. You know, if you sure. give somebody enough anticoagulants, they of will eventually probably leak somewhere. But, you yeah, know, what's the, what's the downside besides the obvious risk of bleeding on any coagulation? <laughs> I'm not I'm not really sure, uh, you know, because afterwards, you know, heparin infusions can obviously be titrated. Sure. Some people in their hospitals may like to use uh, anoxaparin, uh, which is also a fine drug. We know that it has anti-inflammatory effects as well for, for uh, venous and arterial health. A little less to control after you've received the injection, but uh, if you are an ins- or if you're part of an institution that uses unfractionated heparin infusion, and you add rivaroxaban four hours pre-procedure, aside from the increased risk of bleeding, obviously there's probably little to uh, worry about, and it may actually lead to better stent health in the long run. Okay. All right. Is there anything else to consider pre-procedure? I mean, so we, we mentioned the statin. We mentioned a couple uh, anticoagulation regimens. These patients are going to be on some kind of heparin or heparin-related medication. Anything else for uh, considerations with anticoagulation? Sure. I'll say um, also just something to keep an eye out is that there's more research being done into factor 11 and 12 inhibitors um, that we uh, also don't know too much about, at least from the procedural or IR side. We know that a lot of intrinsic pathway thrombosis from veins is probably going to be the main clotting cascade pathway that these clots form because of stasis. And uh, there could be some really great uh, information that's coming out about these kinds of inhibitors in the very near future. So it would be something to keep an eye out for. I don't even know any of the medications that are 11 and 12 inhibitors. Are they are they ones that the general IR would be aware of? Or, or like, if you can just give me a couple names, I'll tell you if I've heard of them. That's a, a good question. I actually, I'm not too familiar with them myself. Oh, okay. All right. So, it, um, so in yeah. general, people don't really, these aren't really on our radar quite yet, right? Okay. Not yet. They're going to be on the radar of your hematologist. Um, gotcha. So, you know, that's, a, and that's another point too, you know, rope your, your hematologist into these patients early on, you know, the ones who have special interest in this, because they're going to be the ones that really can help guide some of the new medicines. And, and with the two people together thinking about this as a, as a team-based approach, I think we can get some really good information. For sure. All right. And then um, do you want to talk a little bit about during the procedure and any coagulation that you use? And and maybe also just want to touch, touch on like some technique as far as venous stenting. I mean, that in and of itself, like can launch into a whole nother series of podcasts. But, you know, just um, uh, just so like set the scene and talk about venous stenting a little bit. Sure. I think uh, something that I like the most about some of the venous work we do is that simplicity really is the ultimate sophistication in a lot of these cases. So, um, you know, knowing how you're going to start uh, picking your sites of access, understanding where your your clot is, and then using that CTV data to really figure out how long your uh, lesion length is and then what you're going to have to do in terms of stents. 
is a great way to kind of think about this beforehand. Uh, if you were to get access, you know, you can get access in the upper or lower extremity depending upon where your uh, thrombus burden was. Sometimes that can lend itself to a groin access in the, in the upper femoral vein. If you're dealing only with an iliac vein lesion, sometimes people come up with extensive DVT that may require popliteal access. You can access clot in the popliteal uh, and then go up that way. A recanalization is often done with your with your basic equipment. A uh, an angled guide catheter and a stiff glide wire uh, can do lots. And once you're through the lesion, um, you switch to a stiffer wire access to maintain yourself across. You can pre-dilate with balloon angioplasty. Some people like to do that as well to create some sort of a tunnel. Uh, many people now, if the clot is particularly acute, at least in its clinical presentation, uh, you can jump right to thrombectomy. And there's a lot of different devices you can use for this nowadays. Sure. Uh, I won't necessarily yeah. go into it. Uh, some people are fans of two-session thrombectomy with, you know, angiojet uh, and leaving thrombolysis catheters across. Not, certainly nothing wrong with that. Other people are switching more towards single-session thrombectomy with some of the Inari devices that can take care of everything without the need for a TPA infusion. Sometimes there's a need for both, where if you don't get everything or you're not happy with everything the first time after a single session, you can still drip TPA and get some kind of a good result. After that, once you have a decent channel, your stent can go in to reconstruct the, the vein. In the special case of anatomic compression syndromes like Mayturner, I emphasize that there's obviously a lot of controversy about how to treat this and if it is even existing. My personal definition is that it has to be the syndrome, which is the most important word in that phrase. Okay. Uh, so somebody has to come in and actually be symptomatic with unilateral left lower extremity swelling. And uh, with an IVUS catheter, um, you can really prove that. You can prove that there's actually going to be compression of that vein. And if you have a DVT on top of that, then I think that you have good enough reason to, to reconstruct it. Fair. Just thinking about Mayturner real quick, do you have any, as far as like the IVUS criteria, is it greater than 50% stenosis? Greater than 50%. Um, oftentimes, you know, with um, some of the pathophys of Mayturner, you can be more convinced it's true if you see some chronic damage of the vein, even in the non-thrombotic lesions. So gotcha. uh, when it comes to Mayturner, you know, we'll often see synechiae within the vein on the IVUS catheter. And that enough to me is also proof, again, with the clinical symptomatology that you should do something to fix it. Gotcha. Um, in fact, we're moving toward more aggressive of this even in younger patients, you know, under under the age of 18, especially in the adolescent group who often presents with Mayturner symptoms, uh, where we're stenting on day one in our institution, uh, in my current pediatric practice. You know, we have to, this obviously extremely controversial. We have great data to support that this is really helping these kids long term. And, you know, the benefit of, of realizing this is that the new normal is an anatomic compression for a lot of these adolescents. So not fixing it could lead to repeat thrombosis and anticoagulation enough is never really going to solve the problem. You have to resolve the compression. But with close look, uh, you know, with close follow up and really making sure that these kids do great, they have great outcomes. They can return to playing sports. They can get back on their feet. Uh, and uh, we see them uh, very frequently for stent checks and making sure that their stents are open and catching things as early as possible. Um, just because, you know, they are young, uh, we want to make sure that they stay as healthy as, as long as they can. Of course. One of the things that I wanted to touch on as far as, and, you know, just talking broad strokes about venous stenting. And one of the things that was drilled into us during training is that even with the greatest anticoagulation regimens, if you have improper stent deployment or, um, undersized in your stent placement, basically like you really have to have a successful stent with good inflow and outflow rather than thinking that uh, your anticoagulation regimen is going to bail you out. Now, I, not to say, I mean, I don't mean to oversimplify it. Of course, like these two things work in concert and it's on a spectrum, but good technical success is going to lend itself to good clinical success with a good anticoagulation regimen. So um, during these procedures, um, anything to mention with regards to anticoagulation regimens and how you anticoagulate during the procedure? Definitely. So pre-procedure, we said the patient should be on some sort of unfractionated heparin. If mm -hmm. you choose to add a 10A inhibitor as well, because of that animal study that I mentioned earlier, there's always that possibility. The patient should be maintained on, on heparin throughout the procedure. We are um, not afraid to do these kinds of interventions on patients while they're anticoagulated. You're putting stents in these veins that are already injured. So during the procedure, thrombosis of these things is, is quite common, as I'm sure many IRs listening to this podcast will, will empathize with. So yes, heparin during the procedure, there's really no need to put anything else uh, on board during it. Uh, I think you can get away with, with, perfectly, uh, uh, with a reasonable result uh, with just the heparin. Many people um, opt to measure uh, ACTs. We've gotten kind of away from that. 
uh, during the procedure. I don't really think it's necessary as long as you can either do a bolus method of heparin or just maintain them on the infusion as need be. Okay. And uh, is the bolus uh, weight-based? Weight-based. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, for, yeah, as, as well as in kids. Gotcha. Um, will you kind of give um, some people, just maybe people who don't do this as often, like a general, any quite, uh, just a general formula for like how to calculate it um, or do you ballpark it based on their weight? You can ballpark it based on their weight. I think, you know, bolusing 5,000 units of heparin in most adult patients is pretty reasonable. The dose for heparin for children, most of the time it's one milligram per kilogram if they're, uh, you know, for most adolescents, you know, is the way to, is way. so very similar to adults. Sure. All right. So um, you have them on uh, uh, single heparin-based uh, medication during the procedure. No need to add anything. If you have a successful procedure, uh, venous stents are laid down appropriately. You're very happy. Um, good pre, uh, I'm sorry, good post venograms. Do you then bolus with anything following stenting or uh, load them up with anything before they're off the table? Yeah. So that's a, that's another great question. So you've completed your technical component of the procedure. You've laid your stent, you've done a venogram, you've confirmed excellent stent apposition as well as expansion with your IVUS catheter because that's also going to be very critical, uh, making sure that your stent is open appropriately, as you said, to fix inflow and outflow. And then uh, at that point, we, or at least what we've decided at, at Washington was that we would leave these patients on a heparin infusion for at least 24 hours after the stent was placed. This is going to be really important to make sure that with any residual kind of stasis that could potentially exist in the stent, that you're going to fight that. We also are very adamant about starting 81 milligrams of aspirin after this. Uh, We had been doing this for a long time in adult patients, but it's nice to have a little bit of data to support that, you know, at apposition points of stents, theoretically, there is some endothelial injury, which could lead to some platelet rich clot. So, starting on 81 milligrams of aspirin uh, within you know, the first couple of hours after the procedure, I think is great because that's going to basically prevent any other kind of thrombus that could potentially form. Now, if you were to use some more of the devices that could potentially cause more shear injury on the vein, um, some of these are more of the mechanical thrombectomy devices that are out there. While their initial data in some animal models suggests that there's really no valvular or, or venous wall damage, there's always the potential for some of that mechanical shear in single session thrombectomy. So Again, it just kind of adds the benefit of, of doing aspirin in these patients if there were to be any wall damage. So another reason to potentially use it. Gotcha. Longstanding treatment after, you know, the, the procedure, uh, you can do warfarin with an INR goal somewhere between two to four or a, in theory, a DOAC or a 10A inhibitor uh, for three to six months if this is the first provoked DVT in a patient. If you have an unprovoked DVT or there's a thrombophilia or hypercoagulable state and it's suspected, anticoagulation is going to have to be continued indefinitely until the workup is conclusive. So that's going to require a genetics workup with your hematologist colleagues, really trying to figure out if there's something underlying here, because that's going to predict how many more repeat procedures you're going to have to do in these patients. So, you know, the, the work doesn't stop just when the procedure is done. We really have to figure out what's causing this to happen to these patients and, and do what we can to fight it. Following the procedure, continue for 24-hour heparin drip and then aspirin uh, PO just at some point after the procedure, as soon as they can take Mm -hmm. orals. And then after 24 hours is when you transition them to their standard outpatient anticoagulation regimen. Is that right? Exactly. Yes. And they should be transitioned when they're in the hospital to make sure that they're at a therapeutic dose of their oral medication before they leave the the hospital that way. Or or if it's even um, an oxaparin, you know, they could be just to make sure that they're at a therapeutic dose before we discharge them. Okay. Going back, though, to the anticoagulation uh, regimens for like your outpatients, uh, will you just tell them to me again? I'm just going to write them down and then we'll kind of dig into each one of them. Of course. Yeah. So you could, um, you know, when you're transitioning, so after the procedure on fractionated heparin for the next 24 hours at least, or to facilitate the transition to an oral anticoagulant, aspirin is encouraged here because of those Espire and Warfossa trials, as we talked about before. And when you're transitioning to them right now, all of the hematologic data suggests that warfarin could be effective with an INR goal of two to four. A DOAC or a 10A inhibitor could be acceptable for three to six months if this is your first unprovoked DVT. I'm sorry, first provoked DVT. Okay, so so warfarin within bounds, uh, Eliquis or Pixaban, uh, Xarelto, Mm -hmm. um, all all acceptable, and then all um, acceptable, and then the 10A inhibitor would be um, Xarelto, Rivaroxaban, and a Pixaban. Yep. 
DOAC would be like De Debicatran, uh, some of your other um, two, like your direct thrombin interpreters. Okay, like, uh, was that also Pradaxa? I think so, yeah. Pradaxa, I think, may also be one. Sorry, you know and you know, I have, their... to apologize. I have to apologize to, I mean, you're actually doing a much better job of it than I am. Sometimes I get mixed up when we cycle between uh, generic and brand names. And I know like our international audience very much appreciates what you're doing with the generics. <laughs> no problem. Yeah. So the bigger trend and Pradax are the same medicine. So that's okay. your, your direct thrombin inhibitor. That's your DOAC. Yep. And then your Xarelto or Roxaban is going to be your 10A inhibitor. Okay. And as far as whethering you, uh, whether or not you choose Warfarin versus um, your um, uh, DOACs, is there is there a preference there or is it uh, Warfarin's tried and true? Um, is it uh, access to these medications? Because I feel like there's an advantage with the warfarin that, you know, if they're, road, if they're coming through a, a Coumadin clinic that you know that they're compliant with their medication and maybe you don't have that information whenever they're on it, though, act. But at the same time, so much easier to be compliant with, you know, Eliquis or Zarelto. Yeah, exactly. So um, and this is where we get to the end of knowledge because, <laughs> uh, you know, we, <laughs> this is this is where we what we don't know. Um, nobody's done a trial to really kind of compare these in the in the stented patient. You know, we know how that they're all very effective at, at trying to accomplish their goals in patients with DBT who are being treated medically with these um, with this comorbidity now. After we've gone in there and messed up the normal, uh, or at least the natural progression of the disease, we don't really know how these behave after we've, you know, potentially have damaged the vein a little bit more or helped the vein by by relieving some of the the injury that the clot was doing. So this is where the there's a dire need for research. Morphin, you're right, is tried and true. It's the oldest, it's inexpensive. It does require patients to go to Coumadin Clinic to to have routine monitoring for INR, which is not super easy for patients. We have to think about mm -hmm. as well that, you know, when patients have DBT or they develop uh, some sort of presentation of a, of a thrombosis, this is a tough time for them as well from a totally empathetic and humanist point of view. I mean, they, you know, their, their activity ability is much less. They have pain. We're trying to prevent post-thrombotic syndrome as much as we can. Uh, they're healing from this. Now they're on a medicine that could potentially make them bleed more. So they have to be a bit extra careful. And now we're telling them that they have to go to a clinic to get this followed up. So it's a lot of things on a, on a grocery list that they have to now kind of do. And I, I feel, you know, kind of bad for those patients. So anything that we can do to find a more easy to take medicine that wouldn't have to fluctuate with their diet as much is obviously desired. But we also know that warfarin does a great job at being an anticoagulant uh, gotcha. when it's in its therapeutic range. So I think that kind of answers the question there. Total benefits to using some of the other ones for sure. But uh, warfarin, while being tried and true, is a, uh, a tough hill to climb. Sure. So you mentioned that anticoagulation will go on for six months or, or I guess suggested um, by your current practice, you guys do six months. Any utility? I feel like I've seen some, uh, not papers, but there was a paper. Uh, let me see if I can pull it up. Yeah, so it was a, a paper that uh, came out in Vascular and Endovascular Review, and their algorithm was taking anticoagulation out to 12 months, um, if I'm not mistaken. But it, mm -hmm. so I, I guess, like, where, where does the six months come from? Sure. The six months is going to be basically at the time that we think that a lot of these stents or stent grafts are going to become incorporated into the vein, or at least somewhat chronic within the, the patient's native anatomy. That's kind of where that benchmark at least comes from initially. Now, I should probably take a step back and, and actually say something here. What I was quoting before in terms of transitioning to those oral anticoagulants would be if you had a patient who underwent thrombectomy and for one reason or another, you did not leave a stent. I should probably have said that before. If a okay. stent was not left and you did thrombectomy, then you would go transition them over to some sort of oral medication. What we would actually in, encourage if a stent is placed anywhere in the body is, is really a noxaparin first after the placement of that. So you do thrombectomy, you decide you're not leaving a stent, unfractionated heparin with no stent, then to an oral transition at some point. If you do leave a stent, anoxaparin is probably going to be your best bet for, you know, the, the, at least the, the one year um, post-procedural period, because we know that with the stent comes probably some local inflammatory effects that could repeat thrombosis, and therefore the anoxaparin can help to dissuade that. Okay, so if you're stenting, then your anticoagulation regimen uh, becomes uh, aspirin, which you continue them on, uh, mm -hmm. and noxaparin for one year? Mm -hmm. And noxaparin for six months. Okay, sorry, six months. All right, uh, mm -hmm. noxaparin for six months, aspirin, mm -hmm. and then anything else on top of that? And then at that point, you can have a conversation with your patient or you can talk to hematology about how you want to continue this long term. This is the part where Again, we don't really have great ways to follow up some of these patients. So 
You could bring them back for a stent check. You can do another IVUS and a venogram just to see how well your stent is holding up. Now, that's one option for children because, you know, we want to try to do as little radiation exposure as possible. For adults, you can go for a CT venogram again at different time points and see how well the stent is looking, making sure that it's not crushed, making sure that there's no new thrombus within the stent or, or appositional narrowing. And if that is the case, then you can either transition to something else like an oral medication or maybe even just take them off of it completely if they've had really great results at different follow-up time points. And it'll be based on your practice of how closely you want to watch these patients. Um, in kids, as I said before, we tend to watch these, these children a lot more closely. So we'll see them in clinic about a month after the procedure to make sure that they're doing well from a procedural standpoint. Stent check in IVUS uh, at three months, six months, a year. And at the year point, you know, if they're doing great, then hematology has been amazing at help us co-manage these patients with their anticoagulation regimens. Oftentimes, they will assess the patient and decide that they no longer need blood thinners and they can come off it. Okay. Are there any uh, situations where um, it's uh, anoxaparin or Lovenox uh, aspirin and then you transition them from Lovenox, like maybe uh, anoxaparin for the first month and then they get transitioned to an oral anticoagulation or... If they can, it's ideal to have them on anoxaparin for the whole the, the duration of the six months. If they can tolerate anoxaparin for three to six months, that's that's great. Okay. If if they had to, if they didn't want to do it, or you want to just transition them to something a bit less expensive, then you know warfarin is probably your go-to. Okay. All right. Yeah, I think price can sometimes be an issue with that. And one thing that I feel like has been missing from the conversation, and I don't know if it has uh, a role in in your opinion. What about Plavix? Yeah, Plavix is a is a good question here. I don't think that there's any data to suggest that it's superior or or has any benefit in doing a dual antiplatelet after these kinds of venous stents because we know that the problem isn't necessarily a platelet mediated clot. Aspirin should be enough to to handle this, but I don't think that there's robust data to suggest that you need a dual antiplatelet in every uh, in every patient. Okay, and then no superiority over Plavix, no superiority of Plavix over just eighty one milligrams of aspirin. Not at least that I've come in contact with gotcha. uh, regard to venous disease. I know the arterial literature sure. is very much different than that, but um, with venous disease, no. Okay. So what else are we missing in terms of like some of the nuances behind some of the anticoagulation discussion? There's a couple exceptions and uh, a couple of kind of special scenarios that you can consider here. So, you know, you have a patient We'll, we'll go back a little bit to the technical aspect. So in the upper extremities, a lot of the time, if we're doing a brachiocephalic vein to SVC recanalization and stenting, we have used very frequently covered stent grafts. So, um, you know, you can use an EPTFE covered uh, stent graft uh, in the upper extremities to the SVC because flow rates, uh, again, with gravity and the likelihood of a patient to use their upper extremity and head and neck is a lot more uh, frequent. You know, uh, patients you know, even if they are bed bound, are sometimes able to move their arms, neck, head a lot easier than they are to move their legs. So you can get away with using something like a covered stent graft to um, open these patients up. And how you choose to do this, whether it be a unilateral or a bilateral kissing approach is certainly operator dependent and what they feel more comfortable with. But if that is the case, you're going to want to really be kind of on top of their anticoagulation regimen because we know that EPTFE, surprisingly, is actually thrombophilic. And we know that, you know, the Teflon material that is the same thing as or very similar to the Dacron that they make mechanical heart valves out of is all generally on the same line of polymer. So that's why we anticoagulate these patients who have mechanical heart valves. We should be doing something very similar and watching this closely to the patients who have these covered stent grafts. With that fact, I tend to recommend against a factor 2A or a 10A inhibitor like the DOAX because... There is another study out there that really studied how these look in mechanical heart valves. And when compared to, it was compared to warfarin. Okay. And basically what the DOAC said was that you would, it would require almost like a four times higher dose of dabigatran or pradaxa to achieve an equivalent INR goal that warfarin would be able to achieve on a, on a normal dose or on, a, on an appropriate dose. So when you're considering something about, you know, a, a stent or a stent graft that uses, you know, these EPTFE materials, Maybe go away from uh, these 2A or 10A inhibitors because warfarin may be superior in these. And that's why we've been using them in, in cardiac patients for so long. Hmm. That's very interesting. And what about um, an antiplatelet uh, medication for when you're uh, laying down a stent graft? 
still uh, a reasonable suggestion um, because of the apposition points of okay. the stent graft that could potentially cause the endothelial damage. Yeah. Again, I, my disclaimer here is that none of this stuff has been so studied in a direct method that we know exactly what's going on. But based on kind of pieces of information that has come through the pipeline in the last decade or two, you can kind of make correlations as to what potentially could work because the pathophysiology is finally making sense to a lot of us. Yeah, well, I mean, that's one of the reasons we bring you on, Fred. If it were easy and everyone could just read the paper, like, then we all just read the paper. <laughs> um, but, like, it, it, it yeah, it's, you're, you're right. It, it's something that's very much has a lot of nuance to it. And I think understanding the pathophysiology, at least just with our discussion here, is, uh, you know, giving me some insight. So is there any um, reason to continue to tease apart? Uh, I guess, like, in my mind, I was thinking, like, malignancy would be this own subset of patients that required, like, kind of a, a separate discussion and... I think a lot of these patients end up on anticoagulation for other reasons. And that may be true a lot of times with a lot of the patients that we're treating is that they require um, treatment for thromboembolic disease, like outside of our the venous stents that we put down. But is there any uh, nuance to kind of tease apart with regards to like uh, venous stenting for malignancy? Absolutely. So back when the DOAX were uh, released and the 10A inhibitors were released, everybody um, got quite excited about what we could do for these in malignancy and how we could treat patients with DVT related to this. Apixaban and another uh, medication in the same group, Edoxaban, uh, has very good efficacy in patients with malignancy based on the trials that were conducted for them. I don't know too many institutions that have Edoxaban readily on their um, formularies. Yeah. But uh, apixaban is certainly one in the same group, and it had very similar similar efficacy for these patients in malignancy, at least based on the trials that were in the New England Journal of Medicine. So these are 10A inhibitors. You can start these as well before, like in that four-hour period before the procedure with the heparin, as we talked about before, because of the suggestion from the earlier paper I referenced. And because of their superiority when it comes to uh, DVT related to malignancy, um, that's one reason why it it should be considered. There is data to support it. Got it. Anything outside of like in the post setting, like other than the, the pre-procedural setting where you may or may not add on um, Eliquis or Apixaban, um, anything uh, further to tease apart with regards to like what their um, outpatient regimen might be? Yeah, I um, so really you can consider patient preference here. Um, you know, if they have dysphagia related to their malignancy, that's mm -hmm. going to be something whether or not they're going to be able to take a pill or not. Sure. Um, in which case you may want to go for an oxaparin because it's injectable. So consider what kind, you know, again, this is SVC syndrome we're talking about now right, in, yeah, in the primarily. setting of malignancy. So, you know, lung cancer, some sort of head and neck cancer affecting this. If they have dysphagia, can't take a pill, consider an oxaparin at that point. Otherwise, if they can tolerate a pixaban or a doxaban, go for it. There's data to support that it's great in use uh, in patients with malignancy. And I'll, I'll add another point here where we should probably recommend it against rivaroxaban because while there's not much support of its use in patients with malignancy, compared to apixaban, it actually had a higher bleeding rate. So another reason to maybe favor apixaban or doxaban if the patient can take it. I hate to put you on the spot. I mean, I know it's hard to like pull, pull that paper from the back of your mind, but do you remember how much higher? Because I, I kind of like put these in like a very similar category and, and um, sometimes understanding right. a little bit more nuance between the two. I, th I mean, I think that's like one of the challenges with finding anticoagulation regimens is that, you know, for me, just kind of a blockhead, I just like to, you know, think in broad strokes, but sometimes a, a little bit of a, a chemist behind it when you're really choosing um, some of the nuances behind like the factor 10A inhibitors. Absolutely. So I have these DOAX and 10A inhibitor trials here that I summarized, but I'm trying to find the one that suggested that rivaroxaban bleeds a bit more. Many of these studies came from something called the Hokusai trial, mm -hmm. which basically looked at uh, edoxaban. And then the Amplify trial was the one that looked at apixaban. Okay. And then the Einstein DVT and Einstein PE trials looked at rivaroxaban specifically. Uh, and they were compared to, uh, the Einstein and the Amplify trials compared their DOAC respectively to an oxaparin and warfarin in combination. And the Hokusai VTE trial specifically was looking at patients with cancer, especially in their post hoc analyses. And uh, this one just compared it to warfarin. And gotcha. uh, it's certainly their primary eff efficacy outcomes were non inferiority. And there were, you know, there were some improvements when it came to the major bleeding concern when it, with, with relation to that. So I think that's why they're, they're more optimal for patients in malignancy. Gotcha. But so the specific one that suggests that the, Rivaroxaban might bleed a bit more, I think, comes from these trials as well, but I don't have a specific note regarding it, so I apologize for that. That's okay. I can go That's back okay. and try to find it in more detail, yeah. We'll throw it in the show notes if we find it. 
All right. So actually, one of the things that we did is we mentioned a lot of uh, re, uh, papers today. Um, I'd love to get mm-hmm. with you offline and uh, get kind of a, a list of some of those papers. And for the the truly interested, we'll post those in our show notes. We're always a little bit delayed on our show notes, but we'll make sure those are anything that we reference during the show. We'll try and make sure that's included in our show notes. As far as resources go, aside from like reading all the papers that, that you've researched, are there any good um, papers that you like for either the uninitiated, the trainees, or even uh, people in practice to help guide their practice? Like, aside from the papers where you have to read them all, do you know what I mean? Like a, a good summary paper. <laughs> yeah, a good summary paper. So every every so often there are updates uh, in the anticoagulation world from various hematologists, and I'm, I'm blanking on the one of them. Again, it's hard to remember all of these things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, you know where to go when you're looking for them, but it's um, difficult when it's actually there. But there are very frequent updates that happen maybe every five to 10 years or so about kind of the current state of anticoagulation with regard okay. to the hematology journals and what the hematologists look at, look at. So I encourage people maybe listening to this episode to really kind of reach outside of the of the the IR space and go into your, you know, your blood. Uh, blood is a great journal for this kind of stuff. I mean, there's things that always pop up there. You'll know that hematologists and oncologists are probably some of the most talented people in the world at creating clinical trials because that is what their work really um, focuses on. They're trying to compare whether it be a chemotherapeutic regimen or an anticoagulant to something else to make sure that something can work better or at least not inferior to something if it can save costs for patients or just have a better efficacy. So teaming up with a, a knowledgeable hematologist at your institution, asking them where they get this kind of information, And then picking their brain as well to suggest, you know, if we alter the anatomy or the physiology of a vein by putting a stent in it or stretching it out or, you know, doing some sort of thrombectomy, what are your thoughts on the effect of what you're trying to do medically for this patient? How can I help? And I think that those kinds of questions, if you have a really good relationship with those hematologists, can go a long way. At least that's how we started. Uh, I know that at the uh, at UW, uh, we've tried to reach out with hematology consults after many of these patients, and that's Mm -hmm. kind of guided our understanding. And then at the children's hospital where I'm at now, our relationship with them is phenomenal. They really take a very common interest with us in treating venous thromboembolic disease in younger patients. And they are happy to see these patients in clinic and help us to manage them collectively. Yeah, for sure. Um, It's a good reminder that we should be reaching out to our physical therapy colleagues, our hemonc colleagues. Um, You know, everyone's kind of working together to for the same end goal. I'll say also, Chris, I just uh, found the reference we were looking for too. It's a paper by Bondi at all uh, called rivaroxaban versus apixaban for stroke prevention and atrial fibrillation, an instrumental variable analysis of a nationwide cohort. It was in uh, Circulation, Cardiovascular Quality and Outcomes that published in 2020. And that is where the slightly increased bleeding risk compared to the other ones in patients with malignancy, or maybe not with malignancy, but just in general yeah, compared in general. to apixaban, could have uh, a higher bleeding risk. Okay. And I can give you that reference afterwards. Yeah, for sure. Definitely. I'll try and get, actually, I'll definitely get with you and try and get all these references uh, for, <laughs> you know, not just myself, but also the audience. Sure. Any stone left unturned? Anything that I didn't ask you that you, I, you know, you wish I would have? Uh, I think, you know, for, for the time we have for these podcasts, I think this is a, a lot of information. Um, you know, this is going to be a lot for people to listen to on their way to work in one day. I apologize for clouding everybody's brain space uh, during your easy commute time. <laughs> no, don't but, apologize. Uh, these guys are these guys are lucky to be <laughs> listening to you, Fred. They're lucky to be listening to you. And for anyone out there, to, uh, an academic institution looking for a pediatric interventionalist, Fred is going to be on the market shortly. I can say for certain he's a bright guy and uh, a lot of institutions to be lucky to have him. In fact, offline, we were talking and I was making a cell for our pediatric hospital here in New Orleans. So um, soon to be available to uh, the the market, Dr. Bertino. Well, thank you, Chris. Uh, I'm just uh, happy to be able to do really interesting cases for people who need them. And uh, a lot of things that I'm saying could totally be wrong in the next couple of years as we learn more about this kind of science. But the whole point of what we do is to push the envelope and when you know the data, or if there is data that exists, know it. And when there is no data for something, figure it out. So that's kind of what I'm taking with me. That's great. All right. To our audience, thank you guys for listening. If you enjoyed the podcast, but would like more, check out the show notes of this episode. They're going to be pretty rich. We're going to have a lot of resources to link to. Those are going to be found at www.backtable.com. And real quick, I'd like to give a shout out to one of our users, uh, Fabian underscore Max. I uh, apologize if I'm pronouncing it incorrectly, but he wrote us a nice review on iTunes. Uh, uh, Fabian or Fabian was a big fan of episode 83 about Dr. Cumpy. So Fabian, thank you for the feedback. If you enjoyed the podcast and want to support the show, here are two easy ways. First, take one second, hit the subscribe button on whatever platform you're listening on. 
This helps platforms like iTunes or Spotify know that you, our audience, value what we're doing and you're interested in getting our latest content as we're producing it. Second, if you're really getting a lot of value from these podcasts, please go to iTunes, like Fabian, and leave us a short written review. This helps us in a lot of different ways. Uh, Plus, we really enjoy getting the feedback. That wraps things up. We'll see you next time on the Backtable Podcast. Fred, thanks for coming on the show. Thanks again, Chris. Thank you so much for listening. If you haven't already, make sure to subscribe, rate the podcast five stars, and share with a friend. If you have any questions or comments, direct message us at at underscore Backtable on Instagram, Twitter, or LinkedIn. Backtable is produced and hosted by myself, Aaron Fritz, and co-hosts Chris Beck, Sabine Don, Michael Barraza, Brian Hartley. Our audio team lead is Karen Gannon with support from Caleb Hodson and Ness Smith Savadoff. Design and digital marketing led by Brian Schmitz with support from Zubi Syed. Article and transcript support by Taylor Robinson and Delaney Aguilar. Social media and PR by Ann Dang and newsletter by Lauren Fang. Intro and extra music is Ripperoo by Skeptic Moon. Find us on Spotify or at local live music venues in New Orleans, Louisiana. Thanks again for listening and see you next week.